Second and Twelfth Night, the two last plays that we're doing, we move into the world of what most people will probably see as the main feature of Shakespearean comedy, disguise and mistaken identity. In particular, females disguised as men. Now, I get students expressing surprise all the time that these disguises seem to be so impenetrable. And they seem almost indignant that this should be so, as if they felt insulted that Shakespeare expected them to be so easily fooled. So I'd like to spend a few minutes addressing some of the problems modern audiences have with disguise in Shakespeare. In the first place, Shakespeare shouldn't be blamed for the practice. It goes back to classical theater, most notably Plautus's Menachme, which every Elizabethan schoolboy would have known. Moreover, Shakespeare doesn't ever expect us to be fooled. We always know that the heroine is in disguise, and we know why. And this fact may make us forget that the other characters in the play don't know these things. Uh, they only see what they see. And more importantly, they see only what they expect to see. Because it's not true that all disguises are impenetrable in Shakespeare, only the ones you don't expect. In Much Ado About Nothing, for instance, um, in the masked ball scene, every character is aware of the identity of the person to whom they are speaking, although they may pretend not to be. It's not even clear if the women are actually masked in this scene, as well as the men. It works equally well if they aren't. Um, I didn't get to see the film yesterday, just so did they have the women masked? OK. Um, but they ha there are performances where they don't have the women masked, and it works just as well. Um, the humor in the account encounter between Beatrice and Benedict depends on her awareness of his identity and her ability to use the fact that he is disguised so she can pretend she doesn't know who he is, to say things that she couldn't easily say to his face. However, later in the play, Don Pedro and Claudio are quite convinced that Margaret is Hero because she is dressed like Hero, she's at Hero's window, and she's called Hero by Baraccio. They see what they are led to expect to see. On the other hand, it's even possible for characters to recognize someone they know well through an even more surprising disguise. The artisans in A Midsummer Night's Dream are appalled by the sight of Bottom with an ass's head, but they know that it is Bottom. Shakespearean disguise is mainly used to fool complete strangers, as it is in Twelfth Night, or people who don't know the character well, as in As You Like It. And here again, people see what they expect to see. Lucentio can succeed in his disguise as Cambio because no one in Padua has seen him yet. And Tranio is very careful to keep supposed Vincentio well away from anyone who might actually know the real one. And yet, The Taming of the Shrew wouldn't spring to mind as a play with everyone running about in disguise and no one recognizing them, as As You Like It has been described to me. So people are far more shocked by Claudio's assumptions about Hero based on what seems to be the evidence of his own eyes at night from a distance and very carefully arranged to deceive him, remember. They're far more shocked by that than they are by Lucentio's disguise, which effectively is abusing a position of trust in, to seduce Bianca, honorably since he seduces her to marriage, but even so a, a seduction. But the real problem is usually the fact that it is a woman disguising herself as a man without anyone suspecting. Students object to it as improbable and generally assume that Shakespeare was doing it because since the female roles were played by boys, he was making it easier for them by getting them back into male costume. This is not the case. It's not easier to play a woman pretending to be a man than it is just to play a woman because the character has to be plausible as both male and female simultaneously. Rather than trying to write a part that a boy actor who struggled with portraying a female could play, Shakespeare was writing for boy actors of tremendous skill. I've seen an all-male production of As You Like It by the Cheek by Jowl Company in London, and Adrian Lester, the actor who was playing Rosalind, did have to convey, while pretending to be Ganymede, that he was Rosalind all the time. And what I found very intriguing was it was actually very easy to believe that he was a woman pretending to be a man, even though I knew all the time he was a man pretending to be a woman to pretending to be a man. <laughs> Suspension of disbelief gets quite easy after a while. Now, from the point of view of the female character, that's Rosalind rather than the actor, the advantage of dressing as a man is clear. 
When Rosalind decides to dress as a man, she does so because the circumstances make being a woman particularly dangerous. Her natural protector in the, in the patriarchal order, that's her father, has been overthrown and banished by his brother and is living as an outlaw in the forest of Arden. Although she has been brought up at court with her cousin Celia, her uncle, Duke Frederick, has now decided to banish her as well on pain of death. Within these 10 days, if thou beest found so near our public court as 20 miles, thou diest for it. Even Frederick doesn't pretend there is any sound reason for, this ban for the banishment. And Rosalind is completely flattened by her banishment. She's unable to respond to cope at all. It's up to Celia to decide what to do. And Celia, throughout the play, is an important catalyst for action. Now, her choice of Rosalind here over her father privileges the bonds of affection between females of the same generation over the duty and responsibility that a patriarchal society would demand that she owes to her father. This isn't problematic, of course, because she is in fact choosing a restoration of the true order. They will go and find Rosalind's father, the legitimate duke, in the forest of Arden. As Rosalind points out, however, there are very real dangers in the plan. Alas, what danger will it be to us maids as we are to travel forth so far? Beauty provoke a thieves sooner than gold. So they are at risk traveling just women alone. Disguise is the obvious solution. Celia suggests that they choose disguises that will hide their social class, poor and mean attire, and smirching their faces with a kind of umber, so that assailants won't think them worth either robbing or raping. The umber would give the effect of sunburn, suggesting that they worked outdoors. Fine ladies were noted for their white skin, to such an extent that women would put cosmetics using dangerous chem chemicals such as white lead on their faces. Um, now, Celia's suggestion would have given them, wouldn't have given them much protection. They would have been less obvious targets, but they would still have been vulnerable to, to sexual assault and robbery. Rosalind's suggestion is a practical one from the point of view of increasing their chances of getting to Arden safely. <coughs> Were it not better, because that I am more than common tall, that I did suit me all points like a man, a gallant kirtle axe upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand, and in my heart, lie there what hidden woman's fears there will, will have a swashing and a martial outside, as many other mannish cowards have that do outface it with their semblances. Rosalind here raises the point that gender is effectively performative. Man and woman may seem simple biological designations, but if you consider related words such as manly, mannish, womanly, womanish, or effeminate, you can see that they carry a range of cultural associations which are not limited to the biological sex of the individual. In Elizabethan society, gender roles were more definitely defined than they are today. There were men's clothes and women's clothes, men's behavior and women's behavior. And as Rosalind's speech shows, men were associated with violence, or at least its potential. Tears were for women, fighting for men, even young men. So someone seeing Rosalind dressed as she describes, with her spear and her swagger, might think, ha, huh, look at him, not even old enough to shave and thinks he's the big man or whatever the Shakespearean equivalent of that is. Um, the point is that they would be unlikely to think, that's a girl, um, because girls don't dress like that or act like that. Now here, for example, is a miniature by Nicholas Hilliard of an unknown youth. How do we know it is an unknown youth and not an unknown woman? Mainly because of the costume. Um, in another miniature, also by Nicholas Hilliard, so we're comparing the same artist, um, we have a portrait of an unknown lady. Change the costumes, and wouldn't it be easy to see the male as female and the female as male? You know, um, People see what they expect to see. Elizabethan fashions also helped as they make it easier to cover any physical indicators of sex or in the case of the codpiece, to add them. Clothes do make the man, and Rosalind expresses her awareness of this when they arrive, destitute and dejected, in the forest of Arden. 
I could find in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and to cry like a woman, but I must comfort the weaker vessel, as doublet and hose ought to show itself courageous to petticoat. Therefore, courage, good Aliena. History provides numerous examples of women who disguise themselves as men in order to t attain particular objects, often military or educational, and successfully passed as men for years. The idea is not implausible and, and in Rosalind's circumstances, quite practical. The two cousins acquire further protection by taking Touchstone the Fool with them. They are now a small group, two men and a, wo and a woman of the lower classes traveling together, rather than, as Frederick presumably intended, a single aristocratic female with no protector. Rosalind's chances of passing as a man and getting to the Forest of Arden safely are considerably better than it first appeared. Now, arrival at the Forest of Arden does not automatically solve the cousins' problems. It is a big place, and even if they find the Duke, he is, after all, an exile living rough in the woods in an all-male society. Their purchase of the cottage, pasture, and flock puts them quite literally in the pastoral world. This gives them security and a place to live, but it also, for an Elizabethan audience, has specific associations. The shepherd characters, Corin, Silvius, and Phoebe, all have names that reflect the poetic expectations of the pastoral setting, where shepherds fall in love with often disdainful nymphs. And of course, Silvius and Phoebe do offer that pattern to us. Now, it may seem curious that Rosalind does not give up her disguise when she finds her father. The reason is probably that she finds Orlando first. We have already seen that Rosalind is in love with Orlando. She and Celia were discussing the matter just before she was banished. Orlando, similarly, has, has fallen in love with Rosalind, but was then distracted by the need to escape from his brother's plot to murder him. You know, it's very hard to get a good emotional affair going when you've got all these things going around. He, with his faithful servant Adam, is also now in the Forest of Arden. And in Act Three, we see that he has, a, had, a, has had a bad outbreak of poetry, or at least an outbreak of bad poetry, <laughs> which you will remember from yesterday is a sure sign that he is in love. Now, the Cheek by Jowl produ production that I mentioned raised a point about recognition and seeing what one expects to see. Conventionally, the one eye that was supposed to be able to pierce all disguises was that of the lover. Once Rosalind has been convinced that Orlando is also in the Forest of Arden and that he is the one writing the poems she has been finding on trees, her first thought is of what he will think of her disguise. Not, will he recognize me, but what will he think when he finds me in disguise. If faith caused his he, Orlando, Orlando. Alas the day, what shall I do with my Dublin toes? What did he when thou sawest him? What said he? How looked he? Wherein went he? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? Where remains he? How parted he with thee? And when shalt thou see him again? But doth he know that I am in this forest and in man's apparel? Looks he as freshly as he did the day he wrestled? Her lines, slightly later in the scene, I will speak to him like a saucy lackey and under that habit play the knave with him, suggests that she expects him to be surprised, but not that he should not recognize her. The Cheek by Jowl production had Rosalind follow her sort of first line to Ro Orlando, do you hear, Forrester, with a facial expression of delighted expression as if saying, it's me, surprise, you know, really excited. And Orlando's very well, what would you? had the effect on her of a slap across the face, so that her next line about be, there, there is no true lover in the forest became a reproach, as well as get, a way of getting the conversation onto the topic of love. And this, then, is perhaps why she remains in disguise. Poetry is not proof enough of love, nor is love at first sight. Rosalind needs to know that Orlando really is in love with her. To do this, she has to challenge his conception of love. She begins by raising questions about the certainty of the world he th as he thinks he knows it by anticipating Einstein's theory of relativity with, the, with relation to time. You think Shakespeare's out of focus with the modern world. When asked to explain his theory in layman terms, Einstein said, put your hand on a hot stove for a minute and it seems like an hour. Sit with a pretty girl for an hour and it seems like a minute. That's relativity. <laughs> Rosalind, on the other hand, can tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. Same idea. 
Although the discussion of the various perceptions of time serves mainly to get the conversation going, it also raises the issue of subjectivity, of varying perspectives, rather than fixed and absolute meanings, which is what Orlando is, the world that Orlando thinks, um, how he thinks the world operates. So when Rosalind then introduces the topic of love and the evils of women, she presents Orlando with an alternative extreme view of women to his equally extreme praise in his poetry of a Rosalind whom he cannot recognize when he meets her in reality. Just as the foot of time can be both swift and lazy, so a woman could be seen as the fair, the chaste, the, inexpress the unexpressive she, or as effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something and for no passion truly anything. Both stereotypes were commonly known. For Rosalind, the problem is that they are stereotypes. She doesn't know if Orlando's love is sincere, or even whether he knows that himself. Men also could fall out of love, as well as in, as we have already seen in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Rosalind needs to learn whether Orlando loves her, not some idealized abstraction that he has invented. And Orlando needs to learn this also. He's very unsure about himself and his love at this stage, and reasonably so. After all, he is a landless younger son, on the run from his hostile elder brother. He has offended the reigning duke. He is an outlaw. And the woman he is in love with is socially his superior, a duke's daughter, even if an exiled duke. And he has only met her once and has no idea if she reciprocates his feelings. So a little bit of uncertainty is excusable. It's not surprising that he doesn't recognize Rosalind. She is quite literally the last person he would expect to be in the forest. And of course, if he had thought that she might be in the forest, he would expect her to be with her father and in her own clothes. Orlando is socially insecure in the early part of the play. His initial complaint in the very first lines of the play is that although he is of gentle birth, he is not being taught how to behave as a gentleman. Other characters, even his brother Oliver, can see that Orlando is gentle, never schooled and yet learned, full of noble device, of all sorts enchantingly beloved. But Orlando himself feels uncertain. In the nature versus nurture debate, Orlando believes in the influence of nurture. But the play itself stresses his natural qualities. Interestingly, these natural qualities tend to be gentle in a moral sense. He is gentle as a person, as well as being a gentleman in the social sense. In this, he seems to be, in the modern jargon, more in touch with his feminine side than the stereotype that Rosalind has earlier used as a model. That's not to say that Orlando is a mannish coward. We see him, after all, challenging Charles, Duke Frederick's wrestler, and beating him. But he is, as Adam says, gentle, strong, and valiant. When Adam, his faithful servant, is dying of starvation in the forest of Arden, Orlando's actions are initially similar to the swaggering image Rosalind invoked. He bursts in on the Duke and his followers with drawn sword, demanding food. The fact that none of them are particularly perturbed by this, Jayquaze even continues eating, shows that they know that this is a bluff. Orlando has assumed that all things had been savage here. He thinks in fixed categories. Finding that the Duke and his followers can overlap with other civilized categories, if ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells have knolled to church, he can now request what before he demanded. And in doing so, he uses the female image of a doe with its fawn to describe his attitude to Adam. Rosalind and Orlando both lack security. Rosalind is a princess, as her father was a reigning duke, but she is also a poor relation after he is exiled kept on at court at Frederick's pleasure and liable, as we have seen, to be thrown out with nothing at a moment's notice. Neither she nor Orlando have, at this stage, any prospects. Love is irrational. Marriage would be folly in the circumstances. Her disguise gives her the space to try to understand her own emotions and to discover the depth of Orlando's. Also, like Beatrice in the masked ball scene, she can say things in her Ganymede persona that she could not as Rosalind. She also, by the way, seems to have invented psychotherapy. Pointing out to Orlando that love is merely a madness, she professes curing it by counsel. The idea that love was a form of insanity was common at the time and had to do with the medical theory of the humors. 
there were four humors, each associated with a particular characteristic. Blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile made you respectively sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholic, or choleric. This could be either a dominant character trait, as in the case of the melancholy Jaques in the play, or an imbalance leading to ill health or madness. Love, which admittedly throws people completely off balance, was therefore seen as a form of insanity, and adolescence was particularly seen as prone to this imbalance. Nowadays, the same sort of symptoms get attributed to raging hormones, but it's basically the same idea. Um, and Rosalind's therapy is to take the form of role playing. Ganymede will act as a surrogate Rosalind for Orlando and Orland allow Orlando to see all the faults of women. Her proposed list of actions that she would, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, all emphasize on the one hand the proverbial fickleness of women, and at the same time, the fact that Orlando's idealized Rosalind is impossible in the real world. Of course, the result of the cure will still be madness, she points out, as her hypothetical previous patient renounced the world and became a monk. Again, she offers him another extreme to counter his present one, but the real aim is to achieve a balance between the, between the extremes. There's also, of course, the question of what Orlando's intentions are. For Rosalind, the choice is clear. Love and marriage go together. In Act 1, Scene 3, when she has really only just met Orlando, she is already speculating about children, as is revealed when Celia questions her on the cause of her melancholy. But is all this for your father? No, some of it is for my child's father. Now, this is not to say that Rosalind lacks any feeling for romantic passion, just that she's more... Uh, pragmatic, perhaps, than Orlando. When the cousins meet Silvius, the lovesick shepherd, she recognizes in his emotion a parallel to hers. At the same time, she recognizes the truth of Touchstone's comments on the follies that love causes. Oh, sorry, I should have shown that one to you last time. Alas, poor shepherd, searching of thy wound, I have by hard adventure found mine own. And I mine, I remember when I was in love, I broke my sword upon a stone and bid him take that for a coming a night to Jane's smile. And I remember the kissing of her battler and the cow's dugs that her pretty chopped hands had milked. And I remember the wooing of a peace cod instead of, of her, from whom I took two cods and giving her them again, said with weeping tears, wear these for my sake. We that are true lovers run into strange capers, but as all is mortal in nature, so is all nature in love mortal folly. Thou speakst wiser than thou art aware of. Orlando, on the other hand, runs the risk of getting stuck in the romantic doting stage of love. His love, when Rosalind first meets him in the forest, is at the exuberant poetry writing stage with the beloved firmly on a pedestal, chaste, inexpressive, and slightly unreal. He is so focused on heavenly Rosalind that he cannot recognize the real Rosalind in front of him. Rosalind and Celia are much more earthy in their views on love, recognizing the physical desire inherent in the romantic idealization. And Touchstone sums up the issue in his courtship of the goat-haired Audrey. Come, sweet Audrey, we must be married or we must live in Baudry. Um, Touchstone, of course, is not very concerned about whether they choose marriage or Baudry as long as he gets Audrey. But for Rosalind, the matter is more serious. Her curing of Orlando is designed to teach him that love has responsibilities as well as raptures. But her feigned reactions and her real ones overlap. In Act 3, Scene 4, his late arrival prompts her to question his honesty and, more importantly, the sincerity of his love. His honesty she doesn't really doubt and defends it quite indignantly when Celia agrees with her a little too much, but on the sincerity of his love, she cannot be sure. But why did he swear he would come this morning and comes not? Nay, certainly there's no truth in him. Do you think so? Yes, I think he is not a pick purse nor a horse stealer, but for his verity in love, I do think him as concave as a covered goblet or a worm-eaten nut. Not true in love? Yes, when he's in, but I think he is not in. You've heard him swear downright he was. Was is not is. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a tapster. 
And of course, Celia has a point. Was is not is. How can Rosalind be sure that Orlando's love will last? When he does arrive, after an intervening scene in which the shepherdess Phoebe falls in love with Ganymede, just to complicate think matters further, Rosalind Ganymede challenges Orlando's assumptions and possibly his fears as well. Complaining about his tardiness, he's only an hour late, he argues, she compares him to a snail, which, as she points out, though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head, a better jointure, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. In this single comparison, she raises two major concerns that a man in Orlando's situation might be expected to feel. In the first place, he has no material goods to bring to the marriage, no house to take his wife to. Although marrying to improve one's financial standing was perfectly acceptable, wildly unequal marriages were not. In this play, Shakespeare combines the fairy tale world, where youngest sons make their fortunes by marrying disguised princesses, with the real world where, where, well, they don't, and a woman expects to marry someone who can provide at least a roof over her head. Um, the mention of the snail's destiny raises the other masculine fear. I, of a snail, for though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head, a better jointure, I think, than I think you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. What's that? Why, horns, such as you, which such as you are fain to be beholding to your wives for. But he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. It please him to call you so, but he hath a Rosalind of a better leer than you. So, Orlando's declaration of his faith in Rosalind's virtue, and remember how easily Claudio was led to doubt heroes, reassures Rosalind so much that she almost gives her identity away. Celia has to intervene to remind her of her role. The next preconception, you might as well stay up here for a little bit. The next preconception that Rosalind has to tackle is that of the romantic love of legend, which is fundamentally tragic. And although she tackled, there's a joking manner in which she tackles this, there, both she and Orlando are also speaking seriously here. Am not I your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are, because I would be talking of her. Well, in her person, I say I will not have you. Then in my own person, I die. No, Faith, die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time, there was not any man died in his own person, vitalicit in a love cause. Troilus had his brains dashed out with a Grecian club, yet he did what he could to die before, and he is one of the patterns of love. Leander, he would have lived many a fair year, though Hero had turned none if it had not been for a hot midsummer night. For a good youth, he went but forth to wash him in the Hellespont, and being taken with the cramp, was drowned. And the foolish chroniclers of the age found that it was Hero of Sestos. But these are all lies. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. I would not have my right Rosalind of this mind, for I protest her frown might kill me. By this hand, it will not kill a fly. <laughs> Whether or not Orlando is actually convinced that love is not really fatal, it is nevertheless after this that he can propose to the pretend as he thinks Rosalind. The mock marriage between them is serious enough that Celia is at first reluctant to participate in the role of priest. Orlando, of course, has no idea that this is not just all a game. But the form of marriage does cover both types of pledge required for a valid marriage, the sponsalia per verbo de futuro, or promise in words of the future tense, and the spons uh, represented by Orlando's I will in answer to Celia's question, and the sponsalia per verba de presenti, a promise in the present tense, as when Rosalind instructs him to say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife, and he repeats it. In a modern ceremony, both forms tend to be used in the ceremony, but the distinction was still important to Shakespeare's day. 16th century law still recognized troth plight marriages as valid, even if no further church ceremony was performed. If Orlando and Rosalind had merely said, I will, they would be betrothed, committed to a marriage at a future date. But if they slept together, the marriage would be confirmed and any children legitimate. That Shakespeare was familiar with this convention and expected his audience to understand it is clear. When Orlando and Rosalind have said, I take thee, it means that they would be fully married and divorce would be difficult to obtain, provided that they both acted intentionally. 
It is clear that Rosalind knows what she is doing, but equally clear that Orlando does not. Rosalind speaks in her own person, makes her own commitment to Orlando, while at the same time recognizing that he is not aware of the full implications. So Rosalind is not trying to trap Orlando into a marriage. Rather, by making him aware that marriage is about now, not some dreamt of future date, she is continuing his education on love. The fact that she almost gives away her real identity at this point suggests that the mock marriage also acts as a safety valve for her feelings. The lesson continues after the mock marriage. Rosalind raises again the misogynistic view of women that was used since classical times as a means of deterring men from marriage, the view that women are fickle, unfaithful, and that they talk too much. I need you again. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hen, more clamorous than a parrot against the rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I will weep for nothing, like Diana in the fountain, and I will do that when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. <laughs> you don't go too far. <laughs> It is not, however, simply women who are changeable or jealous. She begins with the men, for, after all, April when they woo, December when they wed. And it is the Barbary cock pigeon who is the standard of jealousy. And when you compare the constancy of Demetrius with that of Helena, or of Claudio's behavior with that of Hero, the men do not come out terribly well. The other stereotype that has to be overcome is that which equates female silence with female virtue. You will remember that Lucentio fell in love with Bianca mainly because she was quieter than Katharina. And you will remember that Hero's virtue could ultimately only be defended by silence, if necessary, the ultimate silence of death. Katharina and Beatrice, for being verbally witty, both risked losing out in the marriage market. The greatest advantage of disguise for Rosalind is that it allows her to speak freely in an assumed persona, even when that persona is, paradoxically, herself. Orlando, like Benedict, needs to learn that female intelligence is not a threat. Oh, but she is wise. Or else she could not have the wit to do this. The wiser, the waywarder. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, and it will out at the casement. Shut that, and twill out at the keyhole. Stop that, twill fly with the smoke out at the chimney. A man that had a wife with such a wit, he might say, wit with a wilt. Nay, you might keep that check for it till you met your wife's wit going to your neighbor's bed. And what wit could wit have to excuse that? Marry to say she came to seek you there. You shall never take her without her answer unless you take her without her tongue. Oh, that woman that cannot make her fault her husband's occasion, let her never nurse her child herself, she, for she will breed it like a fool. The phrase, wit with her wilt, was a catchphrase of the time used specifically about someone who was chattering too much. For Rosalind, woman's speech is not a sign of loose morals, but of active intelligence. Earlier in the play, when Celia complains that Rosalind keeps interrupting as Celia tries to tell her about Orlando's arrival in the forest, Rosalind exclaims, do you not know that I am a woman? When I think, I must speak. In the passage from Act 4, Scene 1, Rosalind deliberately raises the specter of cuckoldry, a theme in the play, but not a serious threat the way it was in Much Ado About Nothing, to deal with the issue of, a woman's, of women's right to speak, to have a voice in a figurative as well as a literal sense. Despite all the emphasis on fickleness and cuckoldry, neither of these is a serious problem in the world of the play. Unlike A Midsummer Night's Dream or Twelfth Night, the characters are generally in love with the person they should be in love with, and they stay in love. The exception is Phoebe, of course, but even that confusion serves to make her appreciate Silvius more because of his ability to speak of love. Changeability is seen more in the haters than the lovers. The convenient transformation of Oliver from Orlando's enemy to his loving brother, and therefore a suitable lover for Celia, and the no less convenient or sudden transformation of Duke Frederick from fratricidal usurper to monastic recluse. Um, it's all very sudden, very convenient. Similarly, cuckoldry gets talked about and even sung about in the play, but there are no serious doubts about the female character's virtue, as there are in Much Ado About Nothing. Rather, it becomes another part of the bond of male fellowship. 
But the idea that the only good woman is a silent woman is seriously challenged for both Orlando and the audience by Rosalind's disguise and her witty banter. We never doubt her virtue or her love for Orlando, but unlike Katharina and to a lesser extent Beatrice, her wit and linguistic dexterity do not have to be tamed. Even with all Ganymede's teaching about what women are really like and what marriage really involves, it is romantic love, love at first sight, emotional rather than rational, that breaks the deadlock of the play. Oliver and Celia have met, no sooner met but they looked, no sooner looked but they loved, no sooner loved but they sighed, no sooner sighed but they asked one another the reason, no sooner knew the reason but they sought the remedy. Seeing them has made Orlando realize how bitter a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. This gives Rosalind the opportunity to suggest, with some reticence, that she can arrange through magical means for him to marry Rosalind and that it is not impossible for me, if it appear not inconvenient to you, to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is, without any danger. It is almost immediately after these lines that Shakespeare reminds us both of the ideals of pastoral love and of just how many tangles there are still to sort out in the play. Silvius, who is the hapless lover who is a parallel, as the hapless lover is a parallel to Orlando, especially in his poetry on tree stage, and Phoebe, who serves perhaps as an example of at least some of the female stereotypes Ganymede had warned about, reappear. Silvius is made to recite the ideals of love, with the other three agreeing in an effect that is like an operatic quartet. Even Rosalind is swept away by the sheer emotional beauty of the words. Good shepherd, tell this youth what tis to love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears, and so am I for Phoebe, and I for Ganymede, and I for Rosalind, and I for no woman. It is to be all made of faith and service, and so am I for Phoebe, and I for Ganymede, and I for Rosalind, and I for no woman. So you can see they've got this chorus effect going. It is to be all made of fantasy, all made of passion, and all made of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance, all humbleness, all patience and impatience, all purity, all trial, all observance. And then you go, and so am I, and so am I, and so am I. And, and Usually in performance, what happens is that Rosalind is having to hold herself back from saying Orlando rather than no woman. She has to keep remembering her role. Rosalind is, however, still able to retain some sense of balance. And by promising each lover what they think they want in true fairy tale fashion, and there are a great many fairy tale elements in this play, she arranges for the happy ever en after ending the next day. After a scene with Touchstone and Audrey, and a song that celebrates a more carpe diem view of love, not hopeless sighing, but the joys of spring and a reminder that life was but a flower, um, Rosalind sets out the conditions that will make her plan work. The Duke and Orlando both consent to Orlando's marriage with Rosalind. Phoebe agrees to marry Ganymede, but also that if she chooses not to marry him, she will marry Silvius, and Silvius agrees to anything that will mean he gets Phoebe. It's complicated. But the audience enjoy having superior knowledge to the characters on stage. Touchstone is not to be left behind, though, and as he says, I press in here, sir, among the rest of the country copulatives, to swear and to forswear according as marriage binds and blood breaks. He reminds us, as well as those on stage, that marriage is essentially a means of controlling sexual behavior. <coughs> The reappearance of Rosalind in her own clothes, of course, means that the dilemma that both Orlando and Silvius face is resolved, and everyone can now marry the right person. The arrival of Jaquiz Du Bois, the third brother, solves the wider political dilemma and tidies up the minor problem of the fact that they are all, up to this point, homeless exiles. The, end, the ending is partly, and they lived happily ever after, but, as Jaquiz hints in his farewell, it is also more they lived happily as long as they lived happily. We've seen so many sudden changes in this play that this may not leave us with quite as much sense of security as we'd like. Jaquez himself goes off to attach himself to Duke Frederick as he finds all this happiness too much to take. Duke Senior, on the other hand, finishes the main part of the play with the assumption that what begins happily must surely end happily. Proceed, proceed, we will begin these rites as we do trust they'll end in true delights. 
the epilogue, oh, no, I don't have the epilogue. The epilogue spoken by Rosalind brings the responsibility for the happy ending back to us, the audience. Once again, it is a question of subjectivity, but a subjectivity that can be manipulated. It is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome than to see the lord the prologue. If it be true that good wine needs no bush, it is true that a good play needs no epilogue. Yet to good wine they do use good bushes, and good plays prove the better by, help of good, by the help of good epilogues. What a case am I in, then, that I'm neither a good epilogue nor can insinuate with you in behalf of a good play? I am not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of the play as please you. And I charge you, O men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering none of you hates them, that between you and the women the play may please. If I were a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breath that I defied not. And I am sure as many as have good beards or good faces or sweet breaths will for my kind offer when I make curtsy bid me farewell. In this epilogue, Rosalind deliberately calls attention to the fact that she is a male actor, but at the same time refers to the magician role that Ganymede claimed completely imaginary, as we knew, knew throughout the play, but to the onstage characters at least plausible. Her conjuring, however, is to ask the women to like as much of the play as they like, and that the men should like the rest. Each is conjured by the invoking of the love that they bear to the opposite sex. Rosalind's final trick is to, in effect, trap the men into clapping for her, not just by claiming that if she were a woman, she would kiss all of the handsome, bearded, and therefore more manly ones who didn't have bad breath, but also suggesting that those who are handsome, virile, and free of halitosis will clap for her. So if they don't clap, it's because of their own inadequacies, not the plays. It is very much a showman's ending, and Rosalind has been the stage manager throughout the play, manipulating the reality that other characters perceive as well as ours. Now, tomorrow we'll finish our meander down the pathways of Shakespearean comedy, comedic love with Twelfth Night, which also hinges on a disguised heroine and needed a boy actor of considerable skill. In it, Shakespeare is actually returning to the Roman theatre for inspiration, but puts his own twist on the material. So now, are there any questions on any of that today? Yeah, Oliver, yeah. Well, the um, two things, I think. One is that because he's uh, also persecuted by Duke Frederick as Orlando's brother, he's you know, got a sense of what it feels to be bullied. The other thing is that Orlando does save his life. Um, Orlando saves his life from um, both a snake and a lion. Um, the lion was, the snake was about to bite him, and the lion was crouching to pounce on him. And Orlando's there, and he could have let he could have let um, his brother die, but he saves his life. And Oliver has one of these sudden changes of heart. Um, you shouldn't expect too much plausibility. I mean, it's slightly more plausible than Duke Frederick's change of heart. I mean, Duke Frederick is just pure plot device. Um, he happens to meet a hermit who. You know, tells him, you must stop your wicked ways. And he says, oh, right, OK. I had an army. It was about to go and burn down the forest and kill my brother. But no, now you've told me not. I better, guess I better go and become a hermit. Um, it, it really is impossible. <laughs> it is a very sudden change. I've, the thing is, we. It, we have to take the Forest of Arden as a fairy tale world where these things are possible because, um, it, yeah, yeah. Um, and in a sense, it, you see, the, other, the only other options would be to kill off Duke Frederick. He's got to be somehow, um, you do get changes of heart in other characters in other places, like in The Tempest, where, um, but there you see Prospero sort of almost educating uh, through the, the events on the island and 
bring, does what you're saying and brings it around more plausibly, but you're still getting this change of heart thing. Um, I think Oliver's change of heart is a little more plausible um, and can be um, made more, you know, we don't, sibling rivalry is such a complicated thing, you know, and that they can be, we only really see Orlando's viewpoint and we don't even know why at the beginning of the play one brother, you know, there's three brothers. One is the eldest and, and has inherited. He educates the second brother, but not the third. Now, is it because he hates Orlando so much? Is it because they're just struggling to make ends meet and he can only afford to educate one brother? You know, you can play it any way you like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just one of those things that they just irritate each other, you know. Um, but somehow they get they sort out their problems with the help of the lion and the snake. <laughs> Jay Craze, yes. Yes, well, he, he's um, quite willing to have a... a, a well, Jayquay sort of says this isn't going to be a valid marriage. This Sir Oliver Martext is not really, um, you know, a proper priest. And Tuchin says, well, not such a big problem. You know, it's easier to break. So his attitude to marriage is much less um, sincere and romantic than than um, the other characters. Oh, going back to Oliver for a minute, the lion and the and the snake are equally implausible. I mean, what sort of forest? Uh, in in France or or in Europe, do you get poisonous snakes and lions simul large poisonous snakes and lions simultaneously? Sorry, is there a question? Yeah, I was going to directly ask: Was in Shakespeare's times the forest of Arden an imaginary place, or, or did it exist? Because it exists now, but maybe there, the, the, it did exist. There's, and but the question is: Are we talking the Arden in France? Or are we talking the the Warwickshire Arden? Um, but in the play, it's also completely an imaginary place as well. You know, and likewise, the hierarchy. I mean, England had dukes, but it, it didn't have um, some of the, 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 the sort of ranks. No, um, but Duke Frederick is a reigning duke, so that would be like some of the um, grand duchies on the on the on the continent. Yes, yeah. So again, he, he takes. A, it's a it's a made up hierarchy. It's a it's made, up made up. Yeah, it's it's not. It's not anywhere specific. Um, the pastoral world is always slightly um, unreal as well, but it was very much, oh, it's, it's a genre that's instantly recognizable at the time. It's like you suddenly put someone in a soap opera or a science fiction world, and everybody, you know, if you suddenly said, okay, this is, you know, Someone says, beam me up, Scotty, you know you're in Star Trek, yes. yeah. And that's the same sort of thing, that if you get that kind of thing, then you know you've got Corin, Silvius, and Phoebe, um, and Sheep, you know you're in the pastoral world. Uh, okay, anything else? Yeah. Uh, the importance of women's chastity, was there any class base? Was it mainly for the ladies? The um, it was more important the more the land and title, yes. So the higher you were on the social scale, the more important it became because there was more wealth to be passed down and there were titles and it was impor more important. Further down the social scale, what was more important was fertility. Um, so you get, uh, this is where the troth plight marriages come in because you would have a betrothal and then once you knew the baby was on the way, then you get married, which may well be what Shakespeare had, because you know, his first child was born less than, in, less than nine months after the marriage. So um, that was not unusual, um, and it was not, um, they were not considered uh, scandalous. What was scandalous was to have a baby completely outside marriage, um, because that meant that it wasn't clear who was to support it, and often the responsibility under the poor laws fell on the parish, and so there was a lot of pressure um, to find out who the father was um, and to make him 
either marry or support the child. So uh, there, there were various reasons for trying to control female chastity, or at least to control, um, to make sure that there was somebody who could pay for the babies, basically. I saw another hand floating around there. There are sources for As You Like It, um, and just let me see, because they should be in the back of the text. Um, where did I put my glasses? So. No, I've got, I haven't got the sources offhand here. They, this, this particular text doesn't give them. Um, but I know that there are various sources. And of course, he's using different sources for different things, because the, the whole pastoral setting um, you know, comes from a number of different things. Uh, I don't think there's specifically a source for this actual plot as such, but there are lots of earlier parallels, yeah. Anything else? I can't see. No? OK. Well, I will let you go, and I'll see you tomorrow, and we'll do Twelfth Night. OK?